Hello, I'm Dow Robinson, Academic Dean here at the Liberty Theological Seminary, and I'm here to introduce our course entitled Jesus and the Kingdom. This material that I would like to share with you during these next 20 hours on videotape covers what I consider the crucial issue for our day not simply because of personal involvement in coming to know the Lord and to walk in His Spirit, but more than that, to understand what the Lord God is doing today worldwide. I believe that one must have a biblically-based understanding of what is the Kingdom of God. Now, the material on the Kingdom of God is vast. If one could run through the volumes that are on file in the Library of Congress, he would find hundreds and hundreds of titles written over the decades, even in our own country since its founding, on the general subject of the Kingdom of God. It has always fascinated the believer. And your questions surrounding the Kingdom of God are many. Now, as I present the material to you, I want to be sure right here at the start of the course that you understand the direction I'm going and how I will do it. This is basically a course on biblical theology concerning the Kingdom of God. This is not a course on systematics and the Kingdom of God. That will be handled in the theology department. This course can be used equally in missiology, or it can be used among men and women who will be involved in the work of the church here in the country. It's that foundational a course. Now, without an understanding of Jesus' attitude toward the Kingdom, we then are inadequately prepared to address the issue of eschatology. So again, let me say by contrast what I am not doing. This is not a course in which we will engage the issues of eschatology. During the one of the 20 hours that I will be sharing with you on the kingdom, we will touch briefly a variety of positions concerning eschatology. But for most of the course, most of these hours, we will be dealing with the present reality of the Kingdom of God. As Jesus Himself came to exemplify it, to die for it, that is to validate the covenant by His own blood, and finally to inaugurate it with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost until today, until such time as Jesus returns. You remember the blessed hope of the church is the second coming of our Lord. That's our blessed hope, that's what we fix our eyes on, that's what we eagerly await is the blessed hope of the Lord Jesus, the return of our Lord Jesus. In the meantime, what I want to focus on is the present phase of the kingdom. If I could use George Ladd's term, the presence of the future. And let me say that in my own personal background, my first exposure to material on the Kingdom of God was through George Ladd when I was a student at Fuller. And I've uh, collected some of his books over the years, and I find them a, uh, an enticing way of getting into the Kingdom. In other words, Approaching things from his perspective leads me into an interaction with the foundational materials in the life of Jesus, particularly as presented by Matthew, and then through the Gospels on into Paul and Peter and the writer to the Hebrews and James and John, etc. Now, the required book for this course is the book entitled, if I may get it from the shelf here, this book entitled, A Theology of the New Testament by George Ladd. A Theology of the New Testament. 
Now, the reason I'm asking that you purchase this book and work with it is, number one, I will be uh, referring to sections of it regularly, and secondly, I consider it a foundation piece in a long-term library for any of us who are involved in the work of the Lord, whether here in the States or overseas. So that's the book that I will be using regularly in the courses and giving assignments from it. Now, another book which I am recommending uh, certainly not insisting it be purchased for this course, but as a, uh, a valued reference work for your own personal library. This is called the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology by Elwell, E-L-W-E-L-L, -L, published by Baker. Uh, this book carry covers a variety of uh, positions in theology, of movements in theology, um, the names that will become familiar to you over the years are listed here, authors, uh, saints and heretics alike, they're listed in this book and it's like an encyclopedia of evangelical doctrine going way back in the church to the early days in the church itself on through the 19th and 20th century. So I recommend that book for you if you could consider purchasing it. Again, uh, if you, as we say, have access to unlimited funds, then I would buy that one. If you have access to limited funds for uh, building a basic library, I would include that book among one of the basic 20 titles in your personal library. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Kingdom of God as preparation for getting into the materials on the course. What we will be studying for 10 out of the 20 hours are the actual words of Jesus concerning the kingdom that he came to exemplify, to illustrate, that he came to validate with his own blood his fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, and the, co the kingdom which he himself inaugurated in the resurrection from the dead by the spirit of holiness, his ascension into heaven, his being seated at the right hand of the fa Father, receiving the promised gift of the Father, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that it began at Pentecost and continues through today until the age of grace be terminated by the return of our Lord himself. Jesus inaugurated the kingdom. His very presence today through the Holy Spirit validates the kingdom among us. Remember, our focus is the present phase of the kingdom. We are not denying the future phase of the kingdom. We are simply saying that is not in focus in this particular course. And for this reason, without a thorough understanding of Jesus' attitude toward the Father's kingdom, one will not understand apostolic preaching, nor will un one understand what happened in those first and second centuries A.D. And furthermore, one will not understand what the Holy Spirit is doing today. For it is the work of the Holy Spirit to bring to completion this kingdom which Jesus inaugurated. Now, there are many questions about the kingdom. One of them is, perennially, will the kingdom take over the entire world? Let me respond this way. It is our personal conviction that in this present age of grace, there will be a mixture of wheat and tares, according to Jesus' word in Matthew 13. And what that means is that for every work that I do in obedience to the Lord Jesus, Every work that I do in proclaiming his kingdom, in teaching his word, in working with his people, Satan will come along and sow some tares. Now, God tells us about that ahead of time. In effect, he says, don't fret. There's not much you can do personally to stop the work of Satan. God has in his hands 
the wisdom, the ingenuity, and the power to neutralize Satan's work. So we will go ahead proclaiming the kingdom of God. We will go ahead proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And we will go, to, go home at night and we will lie down and sleep in peace. And evil, even while we sleep in peace, Satan will sow some tares. And we will discover tares among the wheat. That's the present phase of the kingdom. There are tares among the wheat. And wise is the worker who understands early in his training process how to handle the tares. One can get frustrated over them. One can desire to exterminate them. One can develop an ulcer and a heart attack being concerned about the tares. My counsel is, let's be concerned about the kingdom itself, about the proclamation of the kingdom, about enabling God's people to walk appropriately and productively in the kingdom, and leave the tares to the living God. He will send his angels at the appropriate time, and he will remove the tares. For that I am deeply grateful, and I will leave in his hands that which is his responsibility. On the other hand, I will learn how to walk in the spirit. I will learn how to wage warfare such that the present phase of the kingdom can continue to grow and expand and so forth. If the apostles themselves could be alive in our midst today, they would be astounded at the progress of the gospel. They would be astounded at the progress of the kingdom. You see, there are somewhere around one and one half billion people on the face of the earth who know and follow the Lord Jesus. There are another billion who have some sort of an acquaintance with the Lordship of Jesus Christ and perhaps would not fulfill our doctrinal or traditional standards. That's a lot of people compared to the known world where the apostolic uh, people operated. The kingdom is being proclaimed. The kingdom is expanding. That's the work of the Holy Spirit worldwide. Now, let's move back to Jesus' day. Let's move back to what he said. And if we could see on the screen, please, the course outline that we will be following over these next weeks as we work through the 20 hours of uh, this course on Jesus in the kingdom. Notice in your week number one, this course outline, uh, I've used the title, The Constitution and Bylaws of the Kingdom. Uh, of course, uh, I picked this up from uh, Bob Mumford's well-known teaching on the kingdom. But what we want to deal with particularly are these crucial questions about the kingdom, and particularly we will be dealing with Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now move on to week number two. You've got this in your uh, syllabus, so if you'd follow it along, uh, not only on the screen, but in your book. Week number two, we continue with the kingdom of God, the bylaws, the constitution of the kingdom. We continue with Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and we continue dealing with these crucial issues. I would like to use the uh, term that uh, George Ladd used in one of his books, uh, the 1952 volume, on, the, on crucial questions concerning the kingdom of God. There are certain issues that have to be brought out in the open in order for us to understand what the Holy Spirit is doing among the church today. Move on to week number three. Week number three. In fact, in week number three and in week number four, we will be dealing with Matthew 10. Matthew 10, the kerugma, the proclamation defined. What is the proclamation? What is the proclamation that Jesus used with his disciples? And move on, if you would, to week number four. Again, it's not only defining it, but displaying the kerugma, the proclamation. What is it? This is Matthew 10. Now notice, our first focus, the first two weeks, uh, the first two full tapes, will be Matthew 5, 6, and 7. 
Then the second set of tapes, tape number three and four, we will focus on Matthew 10. Now move on to weeks five and then week six. This will be, uh, the focus will be Matthew 13, the mystery of the kingdom. It grows and we know not how. The mystery of the kingdom. There's an element within the kingdom that is beyond you and me totally. This is God's kingdom. He is the author. He is the supervisor. He is the energy in it. And he is the one who operates this kingdom. Move on to week number six. The mystery of the kingdom of God. We're still in Matthew 13. And we will particularly focus in week number six on John's gospel and what the gospel means, what the kingdom means in terms of Johannine writings. Move on to week number, week number seven, uh, the, or tape number seven, the witness to the kingdom in Matthew 18. The witness to the kingdom. Notice that in week seven, We'll be dealing with a part of the uh, chapter 18 that deals with humility. And no, notice in week number eight or tape number eight, we will switch from the humility issue to the forgiveness issue. But we are still in Matthew 18. And then move on, if you will, to week number nine or tape number nine. We deal with the future of the kingdom of God. And in week number nine, or tape nine, we'll deal with the presence of the future kingdom. And then moving on to tape number 10, or week number 10, the future of the kingdom of God and the future of the future kingdom. And in that time, we will deal more uh, deliberately with uh, eschatology and some of the uh, prevailing and competing views uh, for uh, eschatology. Now, if you would, Take a moment and look at the diagram that you have in your syllabus. Now this diagram is in the form of concentric circles. Concentric circles. And this diagram will give you an orientation to our approach for understanding the kingdom of God. Now this diagram has a series of seven concentric circles. And I think I will be at the board here for a moment, uh, helping, I trust, to bring some understanding to what I mean by these concentric circles. We start here in the center. And in this center, we have what we like to call And for you Greek buffs, it's very simply the term there in John 1.1, 1, 1, the Logos. The Logos is the eternal word of God. The one to whom the Father spoke and said, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. The Logos, the eternal word of God that was incarnate in Jesus and has become inscripturated in that which we call the Word of God, our Judeo-Christian scriptures from Genesis to Revelation in which we have total confidence. Now, look at it uh, on the screen there. You can see the Logos here in the center. Our starting point for the kingdom of God is the Logos. It's Jesus. Here's where we start. Now, move and continue looking in your own uh, diagram move beyond Logos to the next one. I really should put Logos in here so I don't get my circles mixed up. In circle number two, or concentric circle number two here, we begin to look at what I like to call biblical analysis. Now perhaps in your experience this might better be called Biblical theology. Once we've got the Word of God and we begin to deal with Him first as a person and then as one who is speaking to us. In other words, our starting point is relational. In fact, I have a deep-seated conviction that all knowledge is basically relational. 
Now, number two step. This is one. This is two. We move out from the Logos in personal relationship into the study of what does the text say. Biblical theology revolves around what does it say. The question on how it relates to all other doctrines is the next cycle. But right now, I'm talking about biblical theology. The third one, we usually call this systematic theology, systematics. It's not simply answering the question, what does it say? It's answering the question, how does it relate to the rest of Revelation? Now, obviously, if we're going to investigate the kingdom of God in depth, we've got to start with Jesus himself at the center here as Logos. We look at the words that he has spoken, and we do our best to comprehend them. And then we can begin relating to other issues. Now, I will be working primarily in these first three circles. Now, notice the rest of them in your notebook or on the screen right now. Beyond uh, biblical analysis, which is biblical theology, biblical synthesis is systematics. Move out one more cycle, one more circle, concentric circle. Notice the term practices and methods. Now, to follow that circle around to the bottom phase of it, preaching, teaching, counseling. This is the proclamation, how we do it, how we deal with people who come to know the Lord. Uh, this is the fourth circle out, is equally applied to pastors and missionaries and Christian workers, evangelists, prophetic people, healing ministry, all the ministries of the church. It's the outreach that issues from First of all, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. Secondly, a thorough knowledge of what Jesus said and what his disciples said. And thirdly, a thorough knowledge of how these issues relate to each other. Then we move into the area of studying, uh, preaching, teaching, counseling, missions, etc. Notice the next circle. The next circle deals with church history. And following that, the development of doctrine. As one studies church history, then one does not have to repeat the errors of our forefathers. As one studies the development of doctrine, one then can be founded in what has already happened in the church doctrinally, and again, we don't have to repeat our errors. And then finally, the last circle, the church in cultural context, meaning what does the church look like in Pensacola moving into the 1990s? What does the church look like in the L.A. Basin? What does the church look like on Harvard campus in Cambridge? What does the church look like in Mobile, in New Orleans? What does it look like in Dallas, in Chicago, in St. Louis? What does the church look like in Brussels, in West Berlin? What does it look like in South Africa, in Zaire, in Kenya? in the Asian subcontinent of, Af of uh, India, of what does it look like in China today? What does it look like on the continent of the Americas? The church in cultural context, as we some like to call it, the contextualization of the gospel, the indigenization of the church. All seven of these cycles, these concentric circles, need to be addressed in studying the kingdom of God as well as any other topic in the church. However, in this course, in the 20 hours that I'll be working with you, we will be dealing with the first three concentric circles. First of all, knowing Jesus, hearing and understanding his words, and then relating his issues, his words, and his teachings to other areas of theology. So that set of concentric circles, I think, expresses pretty well how I feel about the pursuit of biblical training, the pursuit of uh, a degree, whether it's in theology or whether it's in missiology. You start with the Lord Jesus in personal relationship. The personal relationship with Jesus will affect how you understand what he says. The person and his message cannot be divided. 
cannot be separated, cannot be isolated. An ongoing life in the spirit I consider essential to understanding this most central topic of the scriptures themselves. Now, let me review once again uh, the uh, five areas in that we will be dealing from the book of Matthew. Let me write them for you here on the board. Again, they are listed several times in your text, in your syllabus in chapter 1. But I just want to reiterate, this is what we're doing. We're looking in the book of Matthew. We are studying these five sections. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew 10, Matthew 13, Matthew 18, and Matthew 24 and 25. Uh, if you have ever taken time to look at the commentaries on the book of Matthew, you will see that all commentaries deal with these five didactic sections in the book of Matthew. This is the way to understand Matthew's teaching. He is saying to us, in effect, brothers and sisters, here are the five basic areas of life that our Lord Jesus dealt with as I, Matthew, walked with him as one of his disciples. So we divide the course of ten tapes into five areas, and we spend two weeks in each of the five areas. Now, as I mentioned, for any one uh, topic that we will study in the two weeks, one of those weeks we will spend on exegesis of what that says, what the text says in Matthew. And the other side of it, we will spend relating what we have learned from the text to a variety of viewpoints concerning the kingdom, a variety of issues concerning the kingdom. But what I want you to assimilate in this first hour is the five didactic sections in the book of Matthew. I believe these five sections control the teaching of Jesus. I feel that these five sections have come forth from the heart of the Father. These are not random groupings of verses. This is what's in the heart of the Father. And Father is still communicating to us today how he feels about the kingdom. Remember, Jesus said, especially in the book of John, chapters 5 and 6, I am here to declare the words of my Father. I, what I hear Father saying, this is what I speak to you. And also he said to his disciples and the leaders, he said, I'm here to do the works, the deeds that Father wants me to accomplish. So that in the book of Matthew, we are dealing with Father's words which he shared with his Son. Jesus says, all the things that Father taught me, I am here to share them with you. So we want to work carefully in these five areas in the book of Matthew. Now, if you would look in your own uh, syllabus to the uh, Roman numeral 2 in this chapter 1, it's entitled Matthew's Didactic Sections. Now notice, in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, this uh, section here that we'll be handling in our first two weeks, Matthew 5 deals with two different areas of life. It deals with attitudes, attitudes, and it deals with situations. Now, when I say situations, what I mean is relational situations. Attitudes, that's the deepest issue in the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. Your attitudes and my attitudes, this is the deepest issue in the kingdom of God. The deepest issue is not eschatology or the format of events when the Lord Jesus chooses to come back. The real issue is attitudes. Attitudes which issue in relational situations. Now that's what we'll be dealing with in this these two hours today, and tape number two in its two hours, these four hours, we will deal with 
Matthew 5, 6, and 7, attitudes and relational situations. Notice the emphasis, relational situations. You see, eschatology is a question that is way down the line. Here, at the foundation of Jesus' teaching, we have the real issues. Now, why would I say that? Well, very simply, because you have to work through this set of chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Matthew 10, Matthew 13, Matthew 18, and finally, when you come to Matthew 24 and 25, then the disciples begin to ask the questions usually associated with eschatology. So four-fifths of this course deals with the more important issues, issues that are more important than the eschatological issues. These are the issues which, by which the kingdom operates, by which the kingdom flows and grows and expands. We need to deal with these issues first, deeply, and then I think we have an opportunity to understand what eschatology is all about. So in uh, looking at Matthew 10, I'll just review this briefly, Matthew 10, we deal with, Matthew, with Jesus' uh, instructions to his 12 disciples to go out and proclaim the kingdom. And in Matthew 10, what you have is a definition, an explication of what is the kingdom, a full-blown statement of what is the kingdom of God as we proclaim it. The disciples went out and proclaimed, and they, when they returned, they said, wow, even the demons are subject to us. And Jesus' response was, don't be too concerned about the demons. The real issue is that Father considers you a child, his own son. You move on to Matthew 13. We deal with, in Matthew 13, the parables. These parables that you've read about for years, but we want to look at the seven parables in Matthew 13, plus the eighth one that's put over there in Mark 4. These eight parables taken together give you a snapshot, a picture of the kingdom in operation today. And as you look at it, you end up where the disciples ended up. You say, this is a mystery. How can this be? Do you realize that wherever the kingdom message is proclaimed, you, you automatically leaven the society, the culture? Do you realize nobody can stop leaven? That's the point of the illustration. When you drop a tiny bit of leaven into a loaf, it permeates the whole thing. Now that's a, a snapshot, just a quick picture of the kingdom. Do you realize that the earth today is permeated with the teaching on the kingdom of God? The earth today, with all its populations, is different than it was when Jesus came on the scene and said for the first time, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's out of Matthew 4. Here we are almost 2,000 years down the road. The world is different. You say the world isn't a mess. Yeah, those are the tares. The world is full of darkness. No, it's not full of darkness. The world has a lot of light in it, and darkness will never overwhelm it. That's what the scripture says. There is light here in the world today on this planet Earth that was never here before Jesus came on the scene. And that light cannot be extinguished. It is an inextinguishable light, and it's called the word of the kingdom. It's the kingdom in operation. It cannot be shut down. It cannot be destroyed. It's the kingdom. See, and one of the purposes in working with this material is for you to grasp the impartation from God's spirit that his kingdom is sure. What that means is, if the sun did not come up tomorrow, I'd be disturbed. But if the kingdom turned out to be a lie, I'd be hopeless. You see, the kingdom is predicated on the covenantal promise of the living God as exemplified and fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth and continued by the presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit now. That's the kingdom. Everything else is subject to the kingdom. 
all physical laws, all matter, all creation is subject to Jesus as head over the kingdom. So the kingdom is priority. In fact, this is the only concept for which there is this statement in the scripture. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteous lifestyle and all things will be added to you. There's no other part of Jesus' teaching that has that particular statement. So the kingdom has priority. Jesus says so. In fact, we are to seek it constantly. Present, continuous action. Keep on seeking the kingdom of God above everything else. And Father says, he will add everything to us. I believe that deeply. I trust that that impartation will come into your spirit over these next days and weeks as we work together. Move on to Matthew 18 in my review here. Matthew 18, what does this say about the kingdom? Two things. The kingdom is witnessed to by your humility and your habit of forgiveness. If my humility and my forgiveness is not being evidenced in my lifestyle, in my office, in my family, then to that extent I am hiding the kingdom by my carnality. So the witness to the kingdom is humility, weakness, excuse me, meekness, gentleness, and forgiveness. Forgiveness that has courage and backbone in it. Forgiveness that is confrontive, that requires li righteous lifestyle. Forgiveness that brings about reconciliation. And then finally, Matthew 24 and 25, we begin to get into some of the uh, eschatological issues. And the title I use for those two weeks is the transfer of government. I want you to witness the transfer of government from the earthly kingdom and the covenant inaugurated through Moses by the angel of the Lord and the transfer of government from the nation that was covenantally uh, linked through circumcision to the government that is presently maintained through the Lord Jesus and his church on earth. Now that's a quick review of the entire course, the five major sections that will Cover, be covered in two different uh, tapes. So we have four hours for each of these five subjects. Now, let's move on to the second general topic I want to cover today. Uh, that first topic was a general introduction to what we're doing. Now, let us address the, some of these issues, what I like to call crucial questions. And if I may, if you would look at the board uh, to your right, my left, uh, there is a set of three issues. Uh, there is the uh, didactic portions of the word in Matthew, and those are the five that we have just been through. There are crucial questions concerning the kingdom, which we're about to touch now, and then briefly I will touch the covenantal background to the kingdom. Now, the didactic sections refer to Matthew's five major teachings. The crucial questions is what I want to get in now. I will refer to them constantly as the CQ. The crucial questions. What are the crucial questions concerning the kingdom of God? There are probably a half dozen of them that you have asked, that people have asked you, that you've wondered about. And if I don't mention your, fam your favorite crucial question, please add it to your, for yourself and write me a note and tell me what you consider one of these crucial issues or crucial questions. The first thing that we will deal with, Jesus' own definition of the kingdom. What does Jesus mean by the kingdom? Number two, we want to deal with Israel and the kingdom. Israel. Israel and the kingdom of God. Now I'm referring to the present phase of the kingdom. I'm not referring to 
the Mosaic Covenant, which I consider terminated at the cross when the New Covenant was validated by the blood of Jesus and authenticated by the Father raising Jesus from the dead and giving the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is Israel today and the kingdom. An issue which preoccupies a lot of people. There are a lot of books written on this. We will mention it regularly. Third, a crucial question. What is the relationship between the church and the kingdom of God? The church. You and I are the church. We are not the kingdom. The church is a society of redeemed people through whom Father exercises his rulership on earth. We are not the kingdom, we are the church. Now, what is the kingdom? If this is the first time you've asked this question or the others, please write them down for yourself. Express them in your own words. Begin to grapple with these issues which will enable you to mature in your understanding of the Lord Jesus himself and what he is doing on earth today. The church and the kingdom go hand in hand, but they're very different entities. The kingdom is the rulership that goes out from the presence of the Father through the church. But the church is a group of people. So we're not the kingdom. We're the church, and yet we live and walk in Father's rulership. That's the kingdom. Now you say, that's not clear. Work on it a while. It'll probably take conservatively six weeks for you to distinguish clearly in your own mind the difference between the church and the kingdom. Usually this question is not asked. For many people, the church is the kingdom. And when you start to make a distinction between the church and the kingdom, the, gre the gears begin to grind, as it were. Uh, we don't have categories for this. So let me say, write this one down. What is the difference between the church and the kingdom? And begin to build, your, build for yourself a series of answers rooted in the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels as well as today. Another uh, question, issue that will be covered in detail is this fourth one. What do the other writers of the New Testament say about the kingdom? You see, one of the things that I derived in my study as a young man at seminary from George Ladd was his insistence that all of the writers in the New Testament are talking about the same basic truth. And I remember clearly, even though that was some 30 years ago, I remember clearly the great sense of peace and understanding that flowed over me when I began to receive that truth and work with it. The writers of the, of the New Testament are not in competition with each other, attempting each to establish his own little kingdom. They are all expressing that which they learn personally by their walk with the Lord Jesus. And yet it comes out different. You see, what is John's expression of the kingdom? John the Beloved. John, the writer of the gospel and the epistles and the revelation. His understanding of the kingdom is not Father's rulership. That's Matthew's understanding. His emphasis on the kingdom is that eternity is here now. We live in the midst of eternal life. And that's why there were miracles all around the life of Jesus and miracles all around the life of the early church because eternity had broken into life. And God says, or Jesus says through the word in John 17, this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. See, eternal life revolves around the person of Jesus who has broken into history unequivocally and left his very person by the presence of the Spirit in the church. Eternity is here now. You and I partake of it. Not fully. I wish we did, but we don't. 
In fact, the whole creation groans and travails, awaiting, eagerly awaiting, the full revelation of the sons of God. Flesh and blood cannot fully inherit the kingdom. So we're in eternity now, but we're not partaking of it fully. But we're learning how to do it. We're learning how to walk in the kingdom. We're learning how to walk in the spirit. And when you walk in the spirit, you are living in the midst of eternity. Move on. How does Paul talk about it? Paul's expression of the kingdom. Notice the term kingdom. You look it up in a concordance and count the number of times Paul uses it, and they're very few. They are specific statements about the kingdom. But he doesn't expound it. And you look at the number of times Matthew uses it and Mark, and it's innumerable practically. Paul's way of talking about the kingdom is life in the spirit. For him, the reality of Father's rulership on earth breaks forth into our daily existence as we walk in the spirit. His only way of operating on earth was life in the spirit, life in the spirit, life in the spirit. That's a byline that is particularly Pauline. His, his phrase, in Christ, in the spirit, that's Paul's expression of Father's rulership. How about Peter? You see, when Peter talks about the reality of Father's work on earth now, he uses two terms. Peter. Remember, he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw the pre-incarnate Christ in his glory. So Peter touched eternity in the kingdom, as did John, but he expresses it in a different way. Peter's way of expression is this. In the midst of suffering, you have both hope and joy. That is the clear demonstration that Father is ruling in his kingdom on earth today. If there is no joy and no hope in the midst of suffering, then all we have on this planet is despair and the blackness of a meaningless universe. But Peter is saying, my brother and sister, don't be concerned about the suffering. In the midst of it, Touch the joy and touch the hope. Now, we could go on talking about more of this, and we will, as I say, review it regularly and touch the other authors of the New Testament. But suffice it to, for me to say right now, let me stir your interest. Develop a notebook of your own. And in this notebook, make a heading for each separate page and on each page, put in one of the crucial issues. I've listed four. This fourth one is called the various expressions of the kingdom of God. There will be more crucial questions. Go on with it. Now, the next thing I want to do in this hour is look, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. And just touch briefly. Uh, and in the succeeding tape, the succeeding hour, I will get into this more um, deeply. I want you to look at Matthew 5 with me. Matthew 5, starting at verse 1. Actually, we'll start at verse 3 and work through verse 12. And I want to present to you a subject that is indeed familiar. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, and you have been in any way involved in the local church over the years, then more than once you've heard the Sermon on the Mount presented to you. And you've heard the teaching on the Beatitudes. Now, what are the Beatitudes? If I may, write it on the board here. I like the term Beatitudes. Remember the word is out of Latin. It has to do with blessedness. 
Now there is a folk etym etymology. There is a way of looking at it only from the, or strictly from the English language, which tells us a lot, but has nothing to do with the etymology of this word from the Latin language. Just put a dash in here. Now, this touches what I want to say. The attitudes expressed in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, there are eight of these attitudes. And these attitudes represent the work of God's Spirit in you and me as he writes the new covenant on our hearts. And these eight attitudes of life constitute the basic inventory of how we operate in the Spirit. These do not come naturally. These are the result of the renewal of my mind. These come because the Holy Spirit continues to renew my new nature. These will develop in you and me as we walk in the Spirit. But what I want you to hear is that this set of eight constitute the basic inventory of my profile in life my lifestyle. These eight will characterize my lifestyle because God has set about to do it in your heart and mind. Now this is a brief review as it were or foretaste of the material in the course. I'd like to pray with you and for you that God would enable us to touch the very person of Jesus, comprehend his words, and begin to articulate his kingdom. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for sending your son Jesus. We thank you for giving him your words. And we thank you for those who walked with Jesus and faithfully recorded his sayings that we might have them in your word today. And I pray for each student that you'd enable each one to walk deeply into the kingdom of God not simply to understand it, but in knowing you to exemplify it to those around him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue what we started in that previous hour <clears throat> concerning Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Remember, the basic assumptions of the Course have to do with the five didactic sections in the book of Matthew. And they're listed on the board behind me and listed in your syllabus. Matthew's five, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Matthew 10, Matthew 13, Matthew 18, and Matthew 24 and 5. And these five sections taken together constitute Matthew's didactic presentation of Jesus and the kingdom. The material that surrounds these five didactic sections is largely illustrative. Let me give a, an example. After Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, then chapters 8 and 9 present a series of physical healings, for the most part, that I think issue from the power released in the proclamation of the kingdom. Matthew 10 then goes on to t present another whole area in the proclamation of the kingdom, what it is. And then Matthew 11 and 12, again, present some healing and some other teaching, and then Matthew 13, etc., through the whole book. Now, these five didactic sections will give us a rather complete expression of how Jesus feels about his Father's kingdom. This material, of course, is further uh, uh, explained and expressed both in the book of Mark and in the book of Luke. 
Luke adds some of his own flavor to it by the Holy Spirit. Then you move on into the other writers in the, God, in the New Testament, including John, Paul, Peter, the writer to the Hebrews, James. Now you put all of these men together in their, ver in their various expressions, and what you get is something like a collage entitled Father's Rulership on Earth the kingdom of God. The source is Jesus, who is expressing the words of his Father. But the teaching is much like a ray of light that hits a prism. I think that the ray of light is Jesus himself, but as his words on the kingdom touched these 12 disciples, that word is refracted into a variety of expressions of the kingdom. But put them all together, the cult and your basic message of the New Testament is the kingdom of God. Out of that, we get a variety of messages about being born again, about the work of the Spirit in our lives, about reconciliation, about healing, about evangelism and church planting, and on and on and on. But your basic emphasis for the New Testament is Father's rulership. Father's kingdom. That's what Jesus came to express, to exemplify, and finally to validate with his own death and inaugurate by his rising from the dead. Now, <clears throat> one other thing I did not mention in the previous hour. I want to take just a couple of minutes and talk about the covenantal background of this kingdom. Now, you remember, if I may... Uh, now, let, wait a minute. Before I get into that, I did want to cover one other review item. One other review item. Uh, if you would look in your uh, textbook, your uh, syllabus, and look at the page that has this diagram of the seven concentric circles, I want to move over to that diagram and go through it once again in order to reiterate uh, my basic convictions on an understanding of the Word of God. We start here in the center with the logos and the rhema, two different Greek expressions of the word of God, which includes or uh, tells us about what it is to know the Lord, to know God. Here's where we start with the logos and the rhema in the knowledge of God himself. Then we move out to one of the next concentric circles that has to do with biblical analysis or biblical theology. We are answering the question, what does the text say? What does it mean? We move from then, from the analysis or the biblical theology, out to this area called systematic theology or biblical synthesis. We are attempting to bring together a variety of teachings into some sort of coherent whole. Now, in this course on the kingdom of God, we will be working with these first three concentric circles. And then as a person pursues his own training, apprenticeship, and study, he will move into the area of practices and methods, which is the same thing as preaching, teaching, counseling, whether you're in the States or in another country. You move beyond practices and methods into church history, into the development of doctrine, and to the church and cult cultural context. This is a picture of the odyssey, of the one, the brother and sister, who is gradually being trained in, a, in apprenticeship to the Lord himself and through his pastoral leadership, he's being trained into a declaration of the whole counsel of God. I believe that within these seven concentric circles, you have an expression of the whole counsel of God. And for me personally, this is a lifelong pursuit of developing more and more extensively all of these seven. Now, I did want to review to that, and now let's move back more specifically into uh, the material on the kingdom of God itself. <clears throat> the uh, covenantal background of the kingdom is something that is worthy of note, and we need to take just a moment to mention it, and you will find this, of course, in your syllabus uh, explained in some detail. 
I want to back up to the covenant with Abraham. Of course, it starts with Abram, and then gradually his name is changed by the Lord specifically to Abraham. But it starts there. We have the covenant through Moses at Sinai. We have a Davidic covenant. We have a new covenant that is expressed in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah and finally, of course, in the Lord Jesus himself. Now, predating the Abrahamic covenant, remember, you have both Adam and Noah. And if you want to talk about covenant in detail, then one must refer back both to Adam and Noah. One can infer from the words that the Lord used in dealing with Adam that the father had in mind a kind of covenantal structure with Adam. And the simplest explanation of the covenant with Adam is that Adam was given a responsibility not only of tending the garden and all the other things the Lord told him to do, but specifically about not eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he failed his test at that point. Uh, the Lord Jesus comes on the scene with a nature much like that of Adam. That is a nature that is untested. It is not confirmed in sin like yours and mine, but an untested nature which Father tested during Jesus' time on earth. And that's why the writer to the Hebrews says, Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Now, the covenant that Jesus fulfilled is the culmination of all the covenants that were expressed to Adam, to Noah. Noah's covenant had to do with building the ark and a few other items that were articulated uh, after, the, uh, after the flood had finished. The covenant expressed to Abraham, approximately, uh, depending on your dating, anywhere between 2200 to 1800 BC. A lot of leeway in there uh, to give people uh, the opportunity to demonstrate more conclusively uh, what specific days we are referring to as regards our own centuries. But the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, Abraham's over there near the Chaldees, and God speaks to his family and says, come on out. Uh, in Genesis 12, then, God specifically talks about uh, seven points of the covenant of what God is going to do. You move on into Genesis 15, you have another expression of the covenant. Genesis 17, a further expression where God says, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. Now, the Abrahamic covenant is expressed in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 16, Genesis 17 has elements which continue to today, but it's not the whole story. It deals with a man and a family. But the part of the covenant that deals with the nation is Moses at Mount Sinai. The angel of the Lord comes down to that mountain and specifically delivers a covenant to Moses, and Moses sheds the blood and sprinkles the blood on the covenant to validate it, and the people of Israel stand around and say, yes, everything you say, everything included in this covenant, we will do. But remember, the Abrahamic part of the covenant is already in operation, and that part includes, remember, it includes justification by faith. Paul's doctrine of justification by faith, both in Romans and Galatians, goes back to our forefather Abraham, in which the scripture says he believed God, and God credited to him as righteousness. That's already included before the Mosaic Covenant comes into effect, which has to do with demonstrating that people are indeed the people of God on earth. We move on to the Davidic Covenant, uh, uh, one expression of it is in uh, Psalm 89. There are several expressions of it, uh, 2 Samuel 7. But one of the portions I enjoy so much is when Father says to David, David, when you sin, I will correct you. Now, that's an added element that you won't find in the Mosaic Covenant or the Abrahamic Covenant. 
and in understanding the covenantal back, background of the kingdom, you have to see the covenant as growing, as it were, as expanding, as including more elements until it is fully revealed in the person of the Lord Jesus. And this leads us, of course, to the uh, ultimate understanding of the eternal covenant and the covenant on earth as a visible expression of that eternal covenant, which in some way, in some way of mystery, involves the relationships among the Trinity. It involves the agreement between the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit of the work of redemption. And it includes you and me as members of the body of Christ, the church on earth. All of that is within the covenant. Remember in Jeremiah uh, 31, 31, you have that first hint of a new covenant coming along in which God is going not simply to tell us what to do, not simply to be our God and to forgive our sins, but especially God is going to change us from what we are into what he wants us to be. And the glory of the new covenant, the glory of it, is that God writes the new covenant on the heart so that we actually become all of these things God talks about, not by strength of my own nature, rather, but by, rather by taking my old nature to the cross and living and walking in the Spirit so that I become a new person in Christ, and my very person, personality is transformed by the inner presence of the Spirit into all that God wants us to be. You can read in Ezekiel 36 a sevenfold description of what the new covenant means and how it's going to operate in our lives. Even as Ezekiel, some 500 years before Jesus came, saw in the Spirit what the new covenant was going to be all about. Now. One of the questions we have for you, long term, one of these crucial issues, crucial questions, how do you see the relationship between the covenant and the kingdom? One of the biblical mottos that I have worked with in my own life is this threefold progressive revelation of the person of God in Jesus. It's the covenant, the cross, and the kingdom. The covenant, the cross, and the kingdom. And as I put those three elements together, it helps me focus on and meditate on the work of God through Jesus Christ that continues today in the church. There is the covenant, there is the cross, there is the kingdom. You put them together, and it's a fairly good synopsis of the work of God in our behalf here on earth, looking forward to the future. Now, what is the covenant and the kingdom? How do they relate to each other? That's a question that I'm not going to attempt to go into detail right now. Again, it's one of the crucial issues. Uh, the kingdom is the fulfillment of all that is included in the covenantal promises. Starting with Abraham back in Genesis 12, continuing on through Moses and David and Ezekiel into the life and person of Jesus and through him and his apostles and the life in the early church right down to today. The kingdom is the living expression and demonstration of God's faithfulness through 3,000 years of history to fulfill every one of his promises. Now, let's move on from that. Let's move on into chapter 5 of Matthew. Let's begin to look at some of these attitudes that I mentioned in the previous hour that will, in fact, determine our productivity in the kingdom of God on earth. There are many ways to study the Sermon on the Mount. Many ways. I suggested earlier that there were hundreds and hundreds of books on the shelves of seminaries as well as the Library of Congress concerning the Kingdom on the Mount. 
a good portion of those books are treatises on the philosophic ethics of Jesus. And the ethics of Jesus are described and defined and displayed, compared with the world's religions, compared to various understandings in the ages of the church, and that's fine. But the way I want to approach these attitudes, if you will, the Beatitudes, these eight attitudes of life, the way I want to approach them is this. God is writing a new covenant on my heart and yours. This new covenant carries such power that I will actually be able to express the righteousness of God as a human being. Now, not in fullness, but in a way that pleases Him. I am not talking about perfection. I am not talking about being entirely sanctified and not being able to sin. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you and me as mortals with an old nature that you and I will carry until we go into the grave. But there is the work of the Holy Spirit so to operate in your life and mine that these attitudes actually become part of my life and your life. In this sense, what is it to be poor in spirit? You meditate on that and think about it and study about it and ask God for insight. But the real issue is whether or not this attitude dominates my life, controls my life. If it does, other people see it in me, I don't see it in me. And when they see it in me, they touch the presence of God and they realize that that poor sinner they're looking at has actually been changed by the power of God. Now there's the reality of the kingdom on earth. I can actually be poor in spirit and not notice. Now that's happened. When that happens, that demonstrates the new covenant is written on my heart. In other words, the new covenant, the attitudes, if you will, the terms of this covenant, the attitudes have been written so deeply in my personality, in my nature, that I act this way and I'm unaware of it. This is called lifestyle. This is called walking in the Spirit, life to, lifestyle by the Spirit. Now these eight, my brother and sister, are being written in your heart and mind. This is the daily work of the Holy Spirit. And these eight attitudes that are being built deep into my very being will result in relational situations that are further explained in these three chapters starting at verse 17 of chapter 5 on through 5, chapter 6 and chapter 7, you have the daily expression of these attitudes. So that if you will look at the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6 and 7, as a, an expression of a set of attitudes that work out in lifestyle. And here are at least a dozen relational situations which Jesus expresses directly in the midst of daily life. And I think Jesus is saying, look men, look women, this is what I'm doing in you. I'm building in you a set of attitudes which will issue in handling life. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom. This is the present phase of the kingdom. Now, let me back off just for a minute and talk about the situation where the disciples find themselves. We are in what is typically called, if you study the life of Jesus, <clears throat> the life of Jesus of Nazareth, this is what is typically called his first tour with his disciples. Jesus has called several men to be with him, and there's a discussion whether all the disciples are present or just the five that are considered the first group. That would be James and John, uh, Andrew and Peter, and probably Matthew. Uh, those five or the whole twelve. Uh, that's not the issue I want to focus on. I don't mind either way. 
if you remember your Sunday school literature, whenever you see a picture on the uh, Sermon on the Mount, you always have 12 disciples seated there, so that must be the answer. Either way, let's look at what Jesus is doing. The first tour, he's got his disciples with him for the first time. They are together operating in the public area, and Jesus is teaching his disciples. That's what it says. He sat down, spoke to his disciples, and there was a multitude there listening. So again, referring to your Sunday school literature, you always have the 12 guys sitting around Jesus, and then a big group of people out there. That's fine. I believe personally these teachings in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are designed especially for the disciples because they are brand new in this whole area of being discipled to Jesus. They are men new to Jesus' teaching. And Jesus is imparting to them foundational ideas. I think Jesus is saying to the men, men, this is Father's kingdom that I'm talking about. It consists of attitudes and relationships. That's where it starts. Now, it's going to work out to touch the entire earth like leaven permeates an entire loaf. But where it starts is in your heart and spirit. And of course, it says in John, when Jesus is talking to one of the Jewish leaders, he said, uh, look, Nicodemus, you can't even see this kingdom until you're born from above. In fact, Jesus goes on to say to Nicodemus, you can't enter it until you're born from above. You've got to be born from above to enter the kingdom. You've got to be born from above to even see that the kingdom is there. So Father's rulership, which is expressed in attitudes and relationships, starts with what has been called through the ages regeneration, presence of the Spirit. Now, these attitudes, these disciples, excuse me, these disciples come to Jesus with a set of attitudes that reflect typical Jewish life of that day. And the primary point I want to make here is that for the disciples, when they hear the word kingdom, they do not think of attitudes and relationships because of the indwelling work of the Spirit. They do not hear that at all. What they hear is the entire background of the Old Testament, particularly the intertestamental period, the previous 400 years, with a lot of Jewish teaching on the Old Testament writings. When they hear kingdom, they hear, they hear Messiah. The, when they think of Messiah, they think of somebody like a general of a vast army of angels who comes down from heaven with his angels to exterminate these dirty Gentiles called Romans, to wipe out the Roman presence from their beloved land, and to restore Jerusalem as a city, not simply of the earthly kingdom in Palestine, but to restore the city to its rightful place of rulership of the entire earth. That's what the disciples are thinking when Jesus says, kingdom. And so Jesus has a job on his hands, and that is to transform the thinking of his disciples from an Old Testament, messianic, eschatological view of the kingdom into a present work of God the Father through His Spirit, which will eventually result in a messianic eschatological catastrophe when Jesus Himself returns. The blessed hope of the church is the second coming of her Lord. I mean the physical presence, the parousia of Jesus Himself on this earth. That we look forward to as the church. But for the disciples, all they could think of was a messianic figure, son of man out of Ezekiel. This Messiah who was governor, who was ruler, absolute ruler, who would destroy Romans, wipe out Gentile control, and establish the Jewish nation as those in power worldwide. Remember, this was their conviction. They were Jews of their culture. 
They were people of their day. They, are, they were not like us when they started out with Jesus. They came as fully developed Jewish men trained in the synagogue, operating in the kingdom which had been around since Mount Sinai and the Revelation, let's say approximately 1,300 years. These 12 men come with 1,300 years of Jewish tradition and teaching from the Mosaic Law and Abraham, and when they hear Jesus, I imagine it's a jolt, to say the least. I imagine they thought many a time, what is this man talking about? So you see the various times, four different times, Jesus says to his disciples, O ye of little faith, the reason he keeps saying it is that they are steeped in the Jewish background of their day. And to set aside that background and receive this new teaching, you've got to be born from above. In fact, you won't even see that there is a kingdom unless you're born from above. You cannot enter that kingdom unless you're born from above. So it behooves us to pause and think about those early disciples and what they went through, the, the wrenching transformation of being only Mosaic, only the Old Covenant, looking forward to the New Covenant. And Jesus is there among them saying, look, I'm the expression of the New Covenant. I'm here to teach it. I'm here to live it out. I'm here to pay for it. That is to validate it by laying down my own life I am here to be resurrected and to receive all authority from the hand of the Father. And for them to receive that in place of all their Old Testament teaching was a long process. You think it took three and a half years? It took a lot longer than that. Remember, at the last showdown at the cross, how many disciples showed up? and said, yea, Lord, you're dying for our sins. Father's going to raise you in three days. We are delighted. No, they all fled. Why? They were afraid. Why were they afraid? Because, you say, well, the Spirit hadn't come in that sense. Well, that's true. But more than that, the transformation from Old Testament Israel into Jesus, the fulfillment of covenant, hadn't fully happened yet. It takes the presence of the Spirit. Now, how far along are you? Have you been moved out of the Old Testament context of kingdom into Jesus' teaching, Jesus' lifestyle and example, Jesus' discipleship of his men? Come on over into the kingdom. Be born again. Be filled with the Spirit. Get on into Jesus' teaching. But the kingdom from Jesus' viewpoint deals with his father's active rulership today. That's the way Jesus looked at it. Remember the word for kingdom, for you Greek buffs especially. I commend to you the study of that word. To understand it by its own context, it really expresses the idea of rulership. Not a physical, geographical nation with boundaries and government and taxes and military. No, it talks about an active ruling from father to you and me. I like to use the term father's rulership or father's ruling. It's a good expression of the term kingdom. And it keeps me from thinking about kingdom as though it were a nation. It's not a physical nation. It is a nation in the sense where the people of God. But let's not compare it to a nation that is listed among the United Nations, the 163 that are on the roster right now. That's not what he's talking about. In fact, the present phase of the kingdom has much more to do with Father's active rulership today in our lives than it does with worldwide conquest. Worldwide conquest will come in Father's time, and he will do it by Jesus. But the emphasis of Jesus' teaching while he was alive and discipling his men 
is the phase of the kingdom I want to emphasize in this course. I think this prepares us not simply to function productively in the kingdom today, it also prepares us to understand the eschatological parts of it. Now, back to the eight attitudes. Let's look at them. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Remember, Jesus is out with his disciples for the first time in this kind of a tour in public. He's imparting to his men what he, Jesus, considers the foundation of Father's rulership, ru Father's ruling in our lives. Number one, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I will go back and forth to the board here and put these on the board one by one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You look at one of the other texts there in Matthew 5, and it, it calls it spiritually poor. Oh, that's fine. Now, you're going to need your Bible with you for these next few minutes, the rest of this hour. So please, if you don't have your Bible in front of you, take a moment, stop your tape, go get your scriptures. I need you to work directly from the text with some note paper where you can add what you need to. Poor in spirit. There are two sides to every one of these proverbs, as it were, these elliptical statements, these pithy sayings from the life and ministry of Jesus. First, you talk about the characteristic, the attitude that God is building into us, and secondly, you talk about the effect in the kingdom. Now notice, for most of these statements, you get rulership. This, to me, is deeply important for you to touch. Attitudes result in rulership. I'm talking about present rulership, where you live in terms of your family, in terms of your lifestyle, in terms of your office, in terms of who you are and what you do in life. These attitudes result in God granting you rulership, or dominion is another way to talk about it. Our idea of dominion and the Father's idea of dominion too often is widely separated. We need to touch dominion or rulership from Jesus' perspective as he is sharing what I feel he means by foundational material. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I commend to you a variety of commentaries that are in your bibliography, in your syllabus, to look at the Sermon on the Mount and try to touch what men and women have uh, understood over the centuries about poor in spirit. Luke drops the terms in spirit. He just says poor. Now we are in a day and age in which this term, poor in spirit, is rapidly becoming a pivotal force in the church, especially Latin America with liberation theology, moving over now into Africa and of course on into uh, India and eventually it'll get into China and so forth. There is a driving force in the world today which talks about poverty as being one of the characteristics of the kingdom. Now, you need to make a deep decision. What does this mean? Poor in spirit. Personally, I feel it has to do with an attitude that I am in need. That is an attitude that emanates from my very spirit. I have known the Lord for about 43 years now. I am just, in mu just as much in need of the Lord today as I was the first day my pastor said to me, Thou, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? A very simple question. It appeals to teenagers at that time. I knew I had no chance to go to heaven at all should I die. So the Lord changed my life. Now, I am just as much in need of salvation today as I was then. I am just as, as much in need of God's provision today for we continue to pray, Lord, would you give me my daily bread? as I was 43 years ago. I am just as much dependent on the Holy Spirit to transform me, to renew my mind, to renew my spirit, as I was then. I have a built-in sense of need. 
And I believe that's one way to express somewhat adequately what it means to be poor in spirit. I'm also aware that many times poverty of spirit is associated with physical poverty. And we worked for some 20 years among people who were marginal as regards uh, starvation. They were marginal as regards survival. The people, the Aztec people we lived and worked among, for an average woman or mother she would give birth five times and three of those would be in the grave. There was never enough food. If you ate one major meal a day, you were considered middle class among those people. Most of the time you had to go to bed hungry or just drink sweet coffee. And they drank coffee, very sweet, because it dulled the appetite. And they are a people, even to today, who as adult males are hungry most of the time, as adult females are hungry most of the time. They are physically poor. This helps people develop a sense of need. And one of our great and crying needs in the U.S. is that out of the blessing and abundance of God, we have lost our sense of need because we have satisfied so many of our physical needs. So please don't disregard the element of physical need and put this only as spiritual need, though I think the root of it is spiritual need. The poor in spirit are those who sense an ongoing need, who live that way and think that way. Notice, yours is the kingdom of heaven. It's yours. You're in it. You're walking in it. It's all yours. Go to it. Number two, blessed are those who mourn. Now, some people will take this and say, I need to be repenting for my sins all the time by forcing myself to suffer so that in some way through penitence, penitence I pay for my sins. I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think the mourning has to do with an awareness that God builds into you and me that you and I are forever sinners until we die and go into the presence of the Lord. You and I will continue to be tainted and contaminated with and by sin until we get our new bodies or go into the presence of the Lord. This is an ongoing attitude. This is present, continuous action. Not only am I poor and in need as present, continuous action, I am also mourning. You see, I fall short of the glory of God. My nature is not yet fully conformed to that of Jesus Christ. And there comes through the work of the Spirit an automatic ongoing sense of mourning. I'm sorry, Lord. I simply don't live up to your expectations. I'm sorry, Lord. I fell short of what you wanted me to do. Lord, I'm sorry, I did not respond the way you wanted me to respond. And this sense of mourning that I believe is part of the new covenant being written on our hearts and natures, this sense of mourning carries with it an assurance of comfort. Therefore, when the sense of mourning comes over me, I will express my repentance before God. I will express my dependency on God because God assures me I will be comforted. Notice, this does not lead to despair. This does not lead a person into discouragement. This does not lead into disillusionment. This leads into comfort. So this is a healthy, vibrant work of the Holy Spirit. Not simply to keep me in a sense of need, but to keep me in a sense of lack of conformity to the very nature of God. Without it, I lose my balance as a Christian. Without it, I get deceived by the lie of humanism, which says if I work long enough and hard enough on my nature, I can make it look good and God will be pleased with it. It's a lie. This keeps me balanced. Moving on. Number three, blessed are the meek or the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Notice, 
The poor in spirit get the whole kingdom of heaven. The meek or gentle get the whole earth. It's like, what more do you want for dominion? What more do you want for rulership? You've got the kingdom of heaven and the earth. It's yours because these attitudes are functioning within you. Notice, this is ground zero. This is where Father's rulership starts. If it doesn't start in attitudes and relationships, it will not issue in dominion in the world. It can't. It's predicated upon attitudes that are worked into me by the Holy Spirit. Blessed are the meek. The word meek, you look it up in Liddell and Scott, classical Greek dictionary. One of your major definitions of meek is the taming of a wild horse so it can be used in war. Let me say that again. A meek horse is a horse that has been trained for servanthood. That's meekness. That's gentleness. The gentleness, the meekness is the result of the training, the apprenticeship with Jesus. And it takes time. Think of a war horse. Think of a horse that is well-trained, powerful, as it were, trembling under the hand of its master, ready to do what the master wants. That's meekness. Please remove from your mind any sense of meekness as Casper Milk Toast, a cartoon, a one-picture cartoon that used to be in the papers some years ago. Casper Milk Toast made himself into a doormat and let everybody walk on him, and this was often called meekness. That is not biblical meekness. Whatever that is, that is a psychological wound in a person's life. That is not what Jesus is talking about. Meekness is availability to Jesus on Jesus' terms. And you wait for him until Jesus speaks and Jesus releases to us what we need to do. Meekness is the result of being subdued by the Holy Spirit. And it takes time. Move on. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Do you have a yen for social justice? If you do, it's because God the Spirit is working in you this attitude, this character quality, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now listen, my friend, this is not only righteousness as a standing, a relationship with God, in which God, from a juridical viewpoint, declares me innocent clean. He holds nothing against me. It's not simply that. It's the result of it in my lifestyle. It's righteousness here and now, based on the fact that I have a righteous relationship with God through his son Jesus. This is righteousness in lifestyle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And for some of you, especially in our day and age, God is stirring in you to make activist statement concerning abortion, concerning pornography, concerning a variety of other social ills like the, the drug epidemic that is upon our population. May God bless you and anoint you to make your statement because it is God the Spirit who is working within you to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Move on. Blessed are the merciful. Just what it says. If you forgive and have mercy, then God will forgive and have mercy with you. This is picked up in, Rome, in uh, excuse me, Matthew 7. He says, judge not lest you be judged. The ruler you use for measuring other people is the ruler that God is going to use on me. Let me say it again. The ruler that I use for measuring you and other people in mercy or judgment is the same ruler God uses on me. So he says, blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. Less and less do I ask God to judge other people. More and more I ask God for mercy. One of the things I noticed that when a person cries out for justice to God, usually it involves somebody else who did something to them. The first thing God does is evaluate the person who's crying out. So ask for mercy. Learn mercy. Number eight, blessed, that is verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in heart. What is purity of heart? 
one of the great exercises in studying the so-called Sermon on the Mount, the Constitution and Bylaws of the Kingdom of God. One of the great exercises is to take the eight Beatitudes, these eight attitudes of life, and match them to the relational situations that Jesus begins to describe later on in chapter 5. Pure in heart to me means to have a heart that is after God and only God. It's called singleness. Singleness. How do you develop from a divided heart to a heart that's pure? So many people tend to look at this as sexually pure. That's the only perspective they take on this verse, as though this verse meant you should not have impure or immoral thoughts. Uh, that may be part of it, but I think it's secondary. I think the real issue is a focus on Jesus. Is my focus on Jesus unique? Is my focus on Jesus a whole one? The whole of my life is focused on Him. That's purity of heart. It says they shall see God. Another way Jesus expresses it is to say, bless, excuse me, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That expresses purity in heart. It's singleness of heart. It's not to have a divided motive. When I say divided motive, what I mean is, if I obey God in this situation, I'm going to look good and it's going to be good for me. That's a divided motive. The issue in obeying God is the privilege of doing what God says. That's purity of heart. Singleness of mind and attitude. Next, move on to verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. A peacemaker is the person who, in the midst of conflict, enables people to find resolution. Check yourself out. Are you the kind of a person that is always pointing out conflicts? Or are you the kind of a person that is finding resolution to conflicts? Are you always pointing out the person's difficulties? How the person disagrees with you or doesn't measure up to a certain standard? That's not a peacemaker. The peacemaker is the person who enables the one in conflict to find resolution. This, so that when we look at one another within the body of Christ, what we see is God's answer to the need in my brother and sister. Verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted. Now this sounds like a switch. If I would, if you would please, I'd like to move to the board and work with this material from the board. I'd like to illustrate a couple of factors. And I'm going to list on the board uh, some of these things. First, we're talking about being poor in spirit. We're talking about mourning. We're talking about being gentle or meek. We're talking about a hunger or a thirst. Hunger, thirst for righteousness. Talking about mercy. Talking about purity in heart. That is singleness. We're talking about peace. And then all of a sudden comes this jarring conclusion. Persecution. Now, I've been talking about eight attitudes, which are, I feel, a fulfillment of the new covenant as God actively writes it into my heart and into my life. Now the question comes here, are there eight or are there seven? Is the work of the Spirit seven attitudes plus persecution? Or is this thing on persecution part of it? Now, I'm going to add persecution here and include it in the eight attitudes. For this reason, without this attitude toward persecution, you're not going to make it. There are a lot of naive Christians that feel that if they follow the Lord Jesus and obey him, everything's going right. That's not true from the scripture. 
we need to receive an impartation from the Lord himself which says to us, when you live like this, you're going to get persecution, and blessed are you. Now, how many times have you personally struggled with persecution? How many times have you seen your brother and sister who collapsed under pressure because they didn't like the way people talked about them as Christians? Or they didn't like the way their fellow Christians talked about them when they obeyed the Lord? And if a person collapses under that pressure, what that says is, this attitude is not yet built in. This is not an attitude of persecution, no. This is an attitude that says, in the midst of persecution, I am blessed because I follow Jesus. See how deep an attitude this is. In the midst of persecution, I count myself blessed because I've obeyed the Lord. I consider number eight integral for the set. We need the whole set, not just seven, and expect persecution. It's the seven attitudes with the crowning one, and the crowning one is this, in the midst of, in the midst of persecution that I anticipate, I count myself blessed of God, for I've had the privilege of obeying him. So your eight attitudes, which taken together constitute the new covenant written on my heart. And I'm sure there are many other attitudes, but I want to start with this set of eight. As these eight get worked into us, then we will be able to handle the relational situations that we will see in the next hour. Blessed are those who are, have been persecuted. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great. What is the attitude being written on my heart? It's to rejoice in the midst of persecution. Therefore, I want to rewrite this thing. It's not simply persecution that is the attitude. It's Rejoice in the midst of persecution. Rejoice. Be glad. I am blessed. You are blessed. Because you and I have been obedient to the Lord in the midst of persecution. Rejoice. Now, a couple of other comments and we'll finish up this uh, tape uh, number one on Jesus and the kingdom. Notice we're still in Matthew 5, verses 13, 14, 15, 16. There are two analogies which Jesus brings forth to talk about who we are in our lifestyle as these eight attitudes begin to permeate our very being. First of all, we are salt. In other words, we will preserve the local society from decaying as f any further than it would have gone. In other words, if you and I were not here, our society would have decayed much further. Notice for civilization on earth, the only hope we can offer them is the kingdom of God in the midst of a decaying order. Because of sin, the world order itself is decaying. It is not improving. It is not getting better. It is not on an evolutionary flow that is forever onward and upward. That's a lie from humanism. We are in a world order that is decaying, and we as salt will keep it from decaying as far as it could have gone. Secondly, as these eight attitudes are worked into my very being, I become light to the surrounding society. So we become salt and we become light in the surrounding society. Now, verse 17 through 20, let me mention it just briefly. Jesus is saying, look men, I'm not here to abolish the law and the prophets. What you hear me talking about in terms of attitudes and relationships is not designed to destroy 
the law and the prophets that you have heard from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You've heard in Moses, you heard in David, you heard in the prophets. No, I'm here to fulfill the whole thing. So what Jesus is imparting to his men is this truth that attitudes and relationships are the real fulfillment of all that Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets ever taught and talked about. Jesus himself is the fulfillment in his person. And by his redemptive work on earth and at the cross, that presence of Jesus is communicated to us by the Holy Spirit on earth, and he changes us into the image of Christ himself. That's the fulfillment of everything that Moses taught and the prophets and so forth. And I think it was extremely important, vital, for the disciples to hear this early in the process. Now, to prepare for tape number two, would you please read the Sermon on the Mount and write an outline for it. Write an outline. Divide it into its major sections, give its minor sections, and several points of explanation under each uh, sub-point. Please make a copy for yourself and send the outline to us here at the school. Let's pray together. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you'd bless each student, enable them to touch the person of Jesus and the message Jesus gives about Father's kingdom on earth. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.